Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. I, I don't need much of an excuse to come up to the Territory every time I've been up. I've really enjoyed it, the land and the people. Um, Tierra, Australia, Tierra Australia is a, um, a con agriculture and environmental consulting company from West Australia and Peter Burgess, the CEO, will be talking to you tomorrow. Um, and also, uh, thanks, thank you for the welcome to country. I th I've heard a lot of them and I reckon that's the best one I've ever heard, actually. <laughs> so thank you for having us here. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is restoring uh, the natural functions of the landscape. A process that we've developed and used uh, in West Australia is uh, we call catchment function analysis. Uh, and I'll show you that for here. So what we do is we analyse the landscape as a functioning system. Uh, how does it work and how did it work? How did it work naturally? So we map out that system, particularly the water system, um, and from that we can figure out how did this landscape work in terms of managing water in the past because the patterns are all there, you just need to learn how to read the patterns. Once you understand how it used to work, um, we can identify the bits that have been disrupted since white management land because we don't need to fix everything. We just need to fix the key components that we've stuffed up. Um, so yeah, we identify the key uh, components that the process has been disrupted. And once we know those key components, then we focus on those and we come up with a design to restore that. And you'll see that this afternoon. Cole uh, and I were out yesterday doing that. Uh, so we designed the interventions. We implemented on the ground. You'll see a bit of that. Um, and then the, the really important bit is to monitor what happens, learn, because that's the best way I've ever learned. Um, so you do something, it stuffs up, go back, why did we stuff it out, how do we do it better next time? Um, and that's the key component. And from that we can improve. So basically that's the process we use for analysing and redesigning landscapes. Just some key principles and hopefully the Seneca, particularly young guys, take home is this. It's about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is we more commonly called um, mechanical energy. It's the energy that a moving ob object has. So it's the energy in your Toyota. When you hit a tree, it's that energy that does all the damage. And kinetic energy, the formula is fairly simple. It's half mass times velocity squared. And this is really, really important. Because if you double the mass, you double the energy. Pretty simple. But if you double the speed, you increase the energy fourfold. If you increase the speed fourfold, you increase the energy 16-fold. This is how you manage the landscapes. You manage this. And the young fellas driving home, remember this. Speed kills. It kills people in cars and it kills landscapes. And so we've, we've got to slow things down. So the other bit, you know, if you're on a hill and it's, it's sloping down, you'll roll down that hill. The steeper the slope, the faster you will roll. Um, and so the steeper the slope, the increase in, the, in velocity and increase in energy, and that applies to a, a water course. The steeper it is, the faster the water, more erosive it is. There's a second principle that's really critical, is that the speed of water in a channel is related to the length of continuous run. So think you're on a hill, you stop, you take your foot off the brake and the car rolls down and it picks up speed. So the further down the hill you get, the faster you go, and if you double the speed, you quadruple the energy. So that applies in a creek line. So the, on a steep creek line, the further the water flows undisrupted, the faster we'll get and the higher the energy. So we can't change the slope of our creeks. What we can do is reduce the length of continuous run. So we need to put structure down the creek line to break up that water flow and slow it down. Um, all our lessons come from Mother Nature. So if you go up into the hills and get the steepest creeks, uh, a healthy landscape, those creeks will be clogged up with shrubs, acacias. That's why she put them there to do this, reduce the speed, the length of the continuous run. Uh, if we burn, hot burn and take them all out and we don't have that structure on the creek line, we're going to get erosion there, but it will create all the problems we see further down speed, uh, stream. 
Um, so, and so the other thing about uh, velocity of water flow, that speed there, centimetres per second, you won't see. Um, so the critical bit's about one to two metres per second. If you're above two metres per second, you start carrying not just sand and silt, but pebbles and boulders, all right, because the energy. If we can slow the water down and get it below about one metre per second, it loses the energy and drops that load. So speed is, is, is critical and we in our landscape should be aiming to slow the speed of water. That's key driver, key principle. Um, catchment function analysis, this is an example. Uh, this is from Ken Tinley and Hugh Pringle and a lot of you probably know Ken and Hugh and Ken's a great artist. So this is the uh, degray catchment in the Pilbara and it's a schematic um, uh, showing all the patterns and the processes and the functions and every landscape is unique, but you'll find these patterns in virtually every landscape, just on different scales. So Ken has shown two subcatchments, one that's dysfunctional and one that's pretty healthy. Um, and so what you tend to see, not always, where you've got a steep hill, but often you'll have a plateau up the top, gently undulating. You'll have small creeks feeding into it, and you should have wetlands. You can have a series of wetlands um, up along that. You get over the, the breakaway, you've got steep slopes, high velocity water, and you've got that trivity drainage pattern where creeks come together and you've all seen that. So every time two creeks join, the mass of water doubles, and so the energy increases. Um, so where those creeks join are critical spots, and in a healthy functioning landscape, you'll have some structure in there to slow them down. Um, you get further down where it levels out, like we are here, on the plains and the water courses will wander through those plains. Um, and then down the bottom you'll have an area where it flattens right out and it fans out. So here you've got a fairly healthy system, it's all fanned out and you'll have a series of ponds. At the grey then, then you've got the riparian zone, the main river channel uh, where the water ends up into. What this doesn't show, that should be full of timber. You know, all those nice flooded gums, uh, river gums and shrubs and grass. Uh, so that structure in there will disrupt the flow, uh, de-energise the water coming down in big flood events. This catchment here is highly dysfunctional and the erosion's cut all the way up through the plains, right up to the top, and it's dehydrated the landscape, as Alison was talking about. Uh, so what we, we analyse uh, catchments in... In this term, trying to identify the critical components have been disrupted. Um, so I'll show you, I forgot my little mess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple more principles. This is from uh, Ken and you, and this is basis of Peter Andrews' work. <coughs> Our landscapes were made up of chains of ponds. Now, how big the chain was, depend how big the pond was, depending on the slope. Very flat country, they'd be very long. Ponds up in the hills, steep country, they're very short, but same system. And it's interesting how the, the flats are made. So the water flows down, it gets a bit level and fans out, and you get a pond. That water carries trash and seed. You've all seen it. The trash and seed will float to the edge, and when the water's gone, you've got that ring around it full of seed. The seeds grow, and they tend to be, you know, often they're short-lived acacias, that sort of thing. They grow up. When the next flood comes through, the water slows down, weaving through that, that, that row of trees, drops sediment and builds up sand. So these banks, contours at the bottom, are actually built up by water and plants. Um, and so that's functioning well. And then our management over the last 100 or so years has created erosion. And that erosion can always works uphill if it cuts through the lip. At the, the step at the bottom of the pond, it dehydrates that pond and it's no longer functioning. And if it keeps going, it'll cut all the way through it. This afternoon, we'll look at a site that um, Cole and I were doing yesterday. And basically, the place we'll go to, that had just happened. It's just cut through there. There's an erosion creek up there. And if it had kept going, they'd join up. So we've just gone and plugged the gap, put the plug back in. So that's a lot of what we do. Put the plug back in the right spot and you, you rehydrate the landscape. Another important pattern that's common in all landscapes is uh, on, a, on slopes, sloping country, 
is level contours built by water and plants. So this is just a bit of air soil on a farm. They've had a rain, washed a bit of litter down and dropped it in contours. Uh, one you might see is on your lawn, same thing, big rain, all the litter's washed up, given a contour. And the other pattern you'll see on the lawn is often you'll get a ring. You'll get a pond there and then you've got that ring around it. So these patterns are called fractals, meaning a pattern that's repeated in itself at bigger and bigger scales. So the fractal up from that is this. It's a Pilbara, the top end of the uh, uh, fit for, uh, Fortescue. And you've got that fractals on the slope. The very, this is the very top of the catchment. So the water, cyclone drops a lot of rain. It doesn't all rush down there. It, it's spread out and ponded behind that. You might not see it. There's a bare patch up the top there. I reckon there's a, there's a water point in there. That's overgrazing around a water point. In more detail in there, you can see what, what those patterns are and the mulga grows. You've all seen them on the contour. So you don't get that pattern on the flats with mulga. You only get it on the slopes. Might be hard to see, but there's a little erosion creek cut up through there. The dark areas around it, that creek is in... Uh, drain water from the sides. The darker out there areas out there have been dehydrated because of that creek, and we could fix that by simply putting a plug in there, and we'd rehydrate that. Um, so mulga grows is a really important part of the lower rainfall uh, rangelands area. In WA, honestly, most of them are stuffed. So this is one that's up the top of the catchment for the Gascoigne River that feeds into Carnarvon. You can see the remnants there, but it's no longer functioning and it's no longer delivering what we call an ecosystem service. One of the ecosystem services is this, to hold water up high on the landscape, slow it down so we don't get big floods down in the mouth of the river. Uh, about 10 years ago, we got a big rain. A lot of the country was like that. No, and before, that big rain would have been slowed down and the water would come out over weeks or months. It didn't. It all came out in a day or two. And that tributary pattern, these all came together. So this massive flood hit Carnarvon and uh, all the irrigation along the, the, the edge of the river blew it out, did a lot of damage. The government... Oh, can you go back to that one? Sorry. The government, after that flood, spent $50 million dollars carting in topsoil back onto those horticultural blocks in Carnarvon, 50 million. To prevent the flood again, they spent another 50 on a levee around the town to protect the town, and it just held earlier this year, but it was that far off of going. The sediments that went out in the bay, the prawn catch halved the following year, and it took 10 years to recover. So we estimate that one flood event cost over $100 million hard cash. So the cost, so we can value, put a value on the ecosystem services of intact functioning mulga grows of uh, more than $100 million in a wet year. So Peter is going to talk more about this tomorrow. So we can, so we know that's one ecosystem service within that catch that's worth more than $100 million in a wet year. And that's part of the natural capital. We can put a value on that natural capital, and I'll leave it to Peter to talk more about it. Next one, thanks. So here, this is Aileron. Uh, can't quite remember exactly where we're here. We're probably a bit over that way. So you can see the pattern of the, of the mulga grows coming off there, and they're actually pretty good and healthy and intact. There's a few problems. We get a bit of erosion creeks coming in, but... Uh, when I look at these, these are very intact and better than I might see in Western Australia. There is one concern that does really worry me, is fire. So what takes out mulga is a repeated hot fires. If you burn this two country, country too often, you will end up looking like the last one. It's inevitable. We, we've always had fire in it, and the traditional owners knew how to manage fire. Lots of cool little burns the right time of year. We now, uh, in, in the West, and particularly the Kimberleys and Pilbara, we're losing that from hot fires. Hot fires are the most destructive thing for Northern Australia. This, I believe, is my opinion, is the biggest issue we need to tackle. Okay, next one. 
All right, so the, another fractal pattern of these contours. Um, so water is, is one, is the key uh, building process in our landscape. And the other one out in, the, in lots of places is wind, and it'll create sand dunes. Um, and you'll, not here, but certainly in from here, and here, you all know this pattern of sand dunes. And so the sand dunes um, actually control the water flow. So in this case, the water flow is up that way. Sorry, it's upside down. And there's a trough there and a fence line. Uh, so on this side, this paddock has been grazed pretty well. The dune's intact and functional. On this side, it's actually been grazed too hard and, and the cattle have walked through the low points. And then when the big rains come, the water's gone through all the way down. So, you know, cyclone rain drops 300 mils of rain. That's going to get stored up there for a long time. Drops 300 mils and that's down in the, in the gas going and it not, you know, a few days later it's wiping out Carnarvon. Right. So uh, that's dysfunctional, that's functional. Um, another of these patterns, this is really interesting, is spin effects. This is uh, Mount Nameless next to the mine. Um, and it's, uh, I only, I lived in the Pilbara for five years. That's the only place I ever saw that pattern. What you've got is the spin effects is lined up in the contour um, and you've got rice paddies with terraces. So when you get 300 mils of rain, it'll fill that pond up. When it's full, it overflows into the next one. When water hits water, it's de-energised. Right? So water will flow down that with no erosion. And we could have put 10 metres of water down that and that pattern, the bottom is stable so there'll be no erosion. Two years ago, it got burnt for the first time ever. The reason that's there, it's next to the mine. Every puff of smoke, they send out the fire trucks and put it out. So I think this is probably several decades to build that. Two years ago, we had a fire. Hot one came up, burnt it out. You might not see it, but the terraces are there. The spinifex is dead. And then a few months later, we had our first decent rain. That whole hill went. That hill now looks like the rest of the Pilbara. So at least one place I know that's what it should look. So, um, you know, we have to use fire to manage fire. In the Pilbara, the, the Rocky Hills are seen in a very little grazing value. So the man, well, as part of the management is the pasture says, I'll burn out a fire break. Hills, no value, I'll burn out the hills, it's in a, which is a shame. That's the last place it should be burnt. Our other problem is gold prospectors because the gold in those, and they burn them. Yeah, we are quick. Okay, so that's just where it's burnt and unburnt. We've got a rosin, keep going, quick. <laughs> um, we need timber up there, because that's the structure, keep going. Okay, this one I should show you. So this is uh, in from Wyndham. Uh, it's a catchment, well, no cattle or donkeys, pristine, no people, and it was like that. But it, was being, it got burnt, hot burnt three out of four years. And there was no litter. When the big rain came, no litter to clog up the creeks coming in. The rain came down, and that's before and after the same spot. That killed the river. What killed it was hot fire. This was killed by fire, finished off by water, and now it's a drain, and that dehydrates, dehydrates the whole system. Yeah. Um, our Mother Nature fixed that. She picks up the trash and carries it downslope and deposits it to form what Cole and I were building yesterday. The key bit, so the pond behind that, and she's built one up there at exactly the right point, another one. So this, when full, will pond to the base of that, that will pond to the base of the other one. And looking the other way, she's got the pond behind there, and she's built a contour to take water out there. So this is what Cole and I and others do. We're just repeating it. So I think the priorities keep fire out of the priority areas, which are the steep hills, river courses, and the mulga. Don't worry too much about the rest of it. Where um, purple and red are getting, though the hills are getting hammered, less so on the flats. What's really interesting, that's the river, which has the highest fuel load. It is the critical bit we can't afford to burn or it'll end up like the Chamberlain. Why doesn't it burn? One reason only, cattle. So people have said you should fence off your rivers 
If we fenced off the river and stopped grazing it, we'd lose that river and it'd end up looking quite the last one. So we all know the damage that stock can do, cattle can do, but they are also, if we use them properly, they're critical to protecting the right. They are your best tool as cattle. So use them to keep fire out of critical zones. Um, landscape rehydration. <clears throat> when we put the package together, this is a farm at, at Jill, Rotto Bree is, is our, the other part of our team. That's what it was like when he bought it. He rehydrated it uh, along the creek lines. Four years later, it looked like that. A few trees were planted. Everything else was natural regeneration on a 150 years old cleared farm. He had a rain in December each, in uh, February, sorry, ran off the slopes into the creek, off the farm. 24 hours after the rain, the creeks were dry. Four years later, he had an almost identical uh, rain within two days and two mils. It, water ran off the steep slopes, filled up the first pond, the next one, the next one. It took three weeks for the water to get the boundary. He went 100 days with no rain, and that was still flowing. So one rainfall event, one day water on the property to 100 days of water on the property. How much time? Sorry. How much time? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Flick here, this, just quickly, this is the analysis I did of uh, aileron, the zones, keep going. So I've done that analysis, we might have to send it out to you. Uh, the creek system just over there, keep going, keep going, and the one where Keep going. Keep going. Oh, one back. Sorry. Right. Uh, we're going to, in the afternoon, come out here. Tributary pattern. The red is where we'd put little blocks in it to slow the water down. The floodplain at the bottom, the erosion creek is cut through the lip, and that's the bit we'll go out and have a look at. We've plugged the gap at the bottom. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>